Hi, Lauren. How are you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm very fine. Great to have you. It's such a nice thing to talk to you directly. Huge honor, let me tell you. Oh, thank you for having me on. This will be really exciting. I love right. talking about these topics and, yeah, ready to answer whatever right. questions you might have. Super delighted. So how have you been, first and foremost? How's everything going for you? Good. Everything's great. Um, I'm, it's a little cold in Florida right now, so I'm a little cold. I have, like, a blanket wrapped around me. <laughs> All right. But had a, you know, great work week. I was actually gone for two weeks, so it was nice to kind of catch up this weekend and, yeah, just doing normal stuff traveling and, and all that and working so awesome how about your your nutrition and training goals for this new year new you yeah well training goals have been awful so i <laughs> i've had a banged up shoulder since like college you know like you just once you i feel like yeah. when you injure your rotator cuff it really never goes back um so it's just kind of been flaring up so my training has been not the best but it's all good and uh nutrition has been i've been pretty stable so that's always kind of my my norm now um and we can talk about that too you know transitioning out of competing to like what totally. is what is that life like right um but yeah so everything good what about you <laughs> i'm doing very well i'm i'm starstruck by seeing you in yes. in, in person let's say <laughs> i know in, in, but anyway this is as good as it's gonna get for now but one day maybe you'll come right. here there. <laughs> oh, I'll be delighted. It will be a huge pleasure. So anyway, to dig into the topic at hand, contest prep, uh, females, challenges of fat loss, I wanted to ask you uh, to kind of uh, dig in into the topic slowly. For you, Lauren, how can you know if a client, or maybe yourself even, if a client is ready for a prep? Because I know you see it all the time. People that, okay, maybe they start a fat loss phase, they, they do very well, and all of a sudden, oh, I want to compete. But maybe they never competed, maybe you just starting work it, working with them. How can you decide? How can you know, in your experience, Lauren, if someone is ready for a prep? Yeah, so this goes for just a fat loss phase in general, but especially a prep. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is applicable to every type of client. But when we talk about contest prep, it is so much more extreme, right? Obviously. So the end goal is so extreme. So what we need to be doing before is much more than for a lifestyle client. So one of the biggest things is looking at how long you've spent out of a deficit. So if you are somebody who is just dieted, like just done a mini cut or you've just competed and you're trying to prep again, that's probably not going to be a good idea, right? So we want to look at how long have you spent out of a deficit? Um, are you in a place, you know, metabolically, hormonally that is stable? Um, and specifically for the physique competitor, are you in a position to where you have enough muscle mass to get back on stage and be competitive, right? That is sure. a really, really important uh, aspect, especially when we're talking about clients who are trying to, you know, earn a national qualification or get a pro card. Uh, if you have been told your last season or your last show, you know, you need to add X amount of muscle and you want to turn around and have a three month off season, that's not going to work. Right. So um, the only time really a short off season works is if a client does have enough muscle mass for their division and they're really, really close and they're pretty much on point and we just need to wait for the next season. That's really the only time that I like people having a short off season. Outside of that, they probably don't have enough muscle mass. And the what it takes to recover from a contest prep in particular is just so much. So a good rule of thumb, which is not, you know, I don't love to give timelines because it's so hard. Um, but a good rule of thumb is let's say you've spent six months in a diet it's probably going to take about six months to recover. And that's just recovery. That's not growth. So again, if we're talking about the physique athlete, this is really important to say how, you know, how much muscle do you need to gain? Where do you need to refine your physique? Um, and then, of course, lastly, you know, are somebody's calories high enough? Are they, you know, that's part of the obviously metabolic and hormonal aspect. Um, and then mentally, are they in a position to prep? Or are they prepping because they're like, I'm fat, I want to diet? huge red flag. <laughs> that is number one red flag that we want to avoid, especially again, when it comes to contest prep, because there's so much physiologically and psychologically that is happening during that period that is so different than a regular fat loss phase. We can't go into it uh, lightly. Yeah, totally. I'm glad you touched on those points about, I think, overall well-being of a person and a good relationship with food and also with training. 
especially in the off season for some people I, I've seen in my own personal experience that maybe the off season it's like a time to be whatever to train whatever to eat whatever but it's actually the hardest time because you need to put on some mass and especially in women and female competitors because they they have a, a starting base of less muscle mass and if they want to compete they want to be like you said competitive it's gonna take uh, quite some time not, not just six months not just a couple of months sometimes maybe maybe even years oh for sure and that like what you said it's such an underrated time which is that off-season period we're building the whole foundation for a prep in the off season, whether it's the muscular foundation, whether it's the metabolic or the hormonal foundation, or just the behaviors around food and what we're doing. You wouldn't expect to just jump into a prep without laying this proper foundation, but people do it all the time. And it's really, really setting them up for an awful time afterwards. It's, it's not Prep is very hard. I'm not going to say prep's not hard. But if you have this huge goal in front of you and you've committed to that publicly, it's a lot easier to stay on track, right? Like, mm. realistically speaking. Afterwards, you don't have this huge goal. Like, you're kind of like, oh, whatever, it's off season, I'm done. That's when things really fall apart. And that is where we see these issues with the, so to speak, rebound. Um, so that's why I try to talk so much about this before and after period of a diet, because the diet is very, very crucial. It's how you're going to reach, you know, stage levels of leanness without just stripping all your muscle mass away. But if we don't have everything lined up before and after, it is going to be really challenging for just years to come. And I mean, that's not an understatement. Like, that's not an overstatement. Sorry. It is not an overstatement to say that you could have troubles for years with your physique and your mindset around food and your body if you don't take care of these times. I think the concept, I'm sure you heard of it, the default diet by the team at 3DMJ. Let's mm -hmm. say you have three to four meals a day. That stays, whether if it's the off-season, your contest prepping, it's just the same. You just adjust your, your energy balance, all that stuff. But you, you, you take your veggies, you take your protein, you, do you agree with that or do you do it a little differently? Um, I, I don't know all the intricacies of that. So I don't want to say like 100% yes or no. But mm. I would say that the general idea of we're eating similar year round is definitely appropriate. Um, I think that a lot of times people try to change things too much. Again, one way or the other, whether it's prep, like, oh, got to change everything. Like, no, that's not a good idea. Um, and we all think okay, what is realistic on a on a on a daily basis because for most people i would say 99 percent of competitors um they have jobs and families and lives right it's not like they're <laughs> bodybuilders um and even for those people i mean for that one percent who is a bodybuilder for a living that still gets really draining to be changing stuff so often so i would say for most people having a set schedule around your food and kind of when you train and all of that is going to be really useful because you only have so many resources during the day. <laughs> and if you are spending so much of your energy, like, Oh, when am I going to eat? What time? How many meals? If you're always changing that, that is so chaotic. Like, no, nope, let's keep it. Like you said, three to four meals. Okay. Going to have that most of the time. And you know, of course there's going to be some fluctuations. If I normally eat four, sometimes I have three, sometimes I have five. But generally speaking, it's not like I'm going from eating two meals a day in the off season to having six tiny meals during prep and then having all these changes and fluctuations. So, yes, I do agree with that on a base level that things should look pretty similar. Um, the amounts are really what's going to be different and, and how much flexibility you incorporate is really going to be the distinguishing factor between prep and an off season. Totally, totally. And I think it's a terrible sales pitch. But I think we agree that not everybody is a, it's a candidate for a contest prep. And just taking out of the, that out of the question, we can begin to establishing our, our starting point, right? Oh, yeah. And that is a very hard thing as a coach, right? When somebody comes <laughs> and says, hey, I want I to do this prep. And I'm all for supporting a client's goals, but it's we have to peel back a little bit. Why do we want to do this, right? Um, and there is a big difference of, hey, I want to just do the show because it's this big goal and I want to set this for myself versus I want to be a very competitive athlete. Um, those are two different types of preps. And I'm not against somebody just doing a show or two because they want to experience it but we really have to preface like what is the reason behind this and here is what could potentially happen um because it is such a competing is such a vulnerable experience really like you know you're getting up on stage to be judged 
on your body by strangers. And a lot of people are not prepared for that. And if you're not prepared for that experience and also probably not to win because there's only one winner, that can lead to a very negative slump afterwards, not just with your physique, but also just like your outlook in general. So I always try to caution people like, hey, I'm all for us wanting to do this, but this is what we need to be prepared for. Um, this is probably how long it's going to take. This is what we could experience. Um, do you want to maybe just do a photo shoot and get pretty lean? Or do you still actually want to get on stage? Because again, I'm good with either conversation, but we need to just be realistic with what's going to be happening. Man, I'm really glad you touched on those points because it's literally getting judged about your appearance. And not everybody's a candidate for that. It's, it, it can be really harsh. Yeah, especially because, like I said, there's there's one winner. And that's the way that the world works with everything. There's one winner. Um, but ultimately, you have to be prepared for that. You have to be prepared for you woke up every day at 5 a.m. to do cardio. You ate your boring ass meal. You, <laughs> and you got third call outs. Like, you have to be prepared for that so i always try to tell people we are training to win but we have to accept any outcome because you are not in control of that whatsoever the only thing we can control is our preparation and how we handle ourselves on show day um and and at the end of the day you could show up and they always give this example you know the apples and oranges on stage especially when we talk about the bikini division um right. almost every other division has a very specific criteria and Bikini division certainly has a specific criteria, but if you look at the top winners, there is a, a more variation in bikini than there are any other divisions, right? So a lot of times people can show up and they can have this bang in physique, but they might be an apple. And then they're on stage with a bunch of bananas, right? And that could be a good thing. That could mean they're gonna be the winner, but then, or that could mean, oh, they're stand out in a negative way. And then the bananas are who is taking the first call out. So that's not something that you're ever going to be able to control. So you can say, okay, how am I going to handle my prep? How am I going to handle, you know, my emotional volatility going into and exiting the show? And part of that too is of course, just having more experience. You know, it is no matter how prepped you are for it, like shit's rough. <laughs> like it is, it is a rough time. Go right. there. And again, to be judged and be in this very vulnerable position. And some people like get off stage and they're like, I never want to do that again. And other people are like, Oh, This is amazing. I can't wait to take two years off and build and come back really competitive. And other people are like, I love it, but it's not great for me right now because of what I had to do. So there's no right or wrong here, but you just have to simply be prepared as that individual um, and just be realistic and honest with yourself. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen people getting drained. They never compete again ever in their lives. They, they don't want to know anything about competitions. Other people kind of just fine. <laughs> they don't seem to have that issue. But yeah. anyway, having having said all that, having established that, that basis that not everybody is a candidate to compete, and that's perfectly fine. Not everybody needs to go through that experience, and that doesn't make them less of a, let's say, less of a bodybuilder, because I think it goes beyond that, right? Yeah, I think it takes a lot of, um, you know, putting your ego aside to say, okay, is this right for me, um, or is this right for me right now, right? Because you could have this yeah. And you could say, you know what, I have a lot of other stuff going on. You know, I'm in school in this really challenging program or, you know, I'm family or I have this other goal that I'm working towards or my career is taking off. Like maybe it's not the best time, but also maybe that is the right time for you, right? Like I have some people who it's like they have all this going on and that could be their rock. And for other people, it's the actual opposite, right? So we have to just totally. consideration like, hey, where is this client right now um and i just think as coaches you just have to be very upfront with people and especially first time competitor right i'll have somebody come to me and say hey i want to do a show in in 12 weeks like okay no <laughs> uh we're doing that and uh unless you are the most jacked and lean person that i've ever worked with it's probably not going to happen right and do 12 week preps happen certainly um uh, but again those are going to be clients who are going to be people who are genetically pretty lean already um and that's still even pushing it so if somebody comes to me and they say i've never done a show but i want to compete I say okay let's let's reverse engineer this about a year and then i usually hear like crickets and like i get a lot of looks like what and it's like yeah. yeah it might be sooner than that but chances are we need a solid six month off season and we probably need a solid six month prep and if you're not prepared for that then you're probably not ready to get on stage totally it's always the the 12 week for some reason it's like an arbitrary number but keeps keeps on going i i, I still hear it it is it is still alive and strong and like i said <laughs> They can do it, but it is not the <clears throat> a prep. Um, and especially if we're talking about a natural athlete, even if we're talking about an enhanced athlete, that is still a short sure. 
prep, you know. Um, now, I know people who do them and they look great and they have great preps, right? So it's not like you can't. Um, but for the majority of clients, especially a new client, <laughs> sure, it, sure. Uh, and especially somebody that you've never worked with, right? So this, for this hypothetical situation, this is someone who's coming to you and saying, hey, I've never worked with you. I want to do a show. I don't know how your body's going to respond. You could be the slowest responder ever. So if you happen to be dropping really quick, sure, let's jump into a show. But if you're not, I want to give that buffer, have that expectation, because there's nothing worse than setting an expectation that's super high and it's not met. Everybody will have a dopamine crash from that and everybody will feel disappointed. Right, right. So let's dig in into the, the starting point. Let's let's dig in into starting a, a contest prep diet. Um. I think one of the major limitations in regards to, to the evidence-based community is that most research, as you surely know, is carried out in male subjects. So we, can, we can't always extrapolate from the, from the recommendations to women. But I think one thing we can still apply is maybe the rate of weight loss. How do you, do you like to start? Do you like to go aggressive at first, maybe to motivate people? Or do you like to start slowly, let's say... Um, 0.5% of weight loss per, per week or how do you like to once you know your client once you know they're ready for a contest prep how you like to start it I would say that I'm definitely more aggressive in the beginning uh, for a few reasons one we are either in a surplus or the very high end of their maintenance and if we just make a small drop mm -hmm. we're probably still in maintenance right so this is what i used to do when i first started like oh we got to start really slow we want to you know maintain as much muscle mass as possible and then i would slowly chip away and not really see any changes because again we were still kind of maintenance for clients so what i also recognized was all right well this is pretty ineffective uh the client is of course getting frustrated and then not even just that but at a higher body fat we're at a lower risk of losing muscle mass at that point versus later on mm -hmm. in the when they're much leaner. So I am definitely more aggressive from the get go. Um, you know, not saying we're, we're dropping like all of their food, but we are going to make a substantial drop. Probably not going to do, uh, I may do a small refeed or none. I might just have a linear approach in the beginning for a contest rep client. Um, it really just depends on kind of what their intake is like and what their metabolism can handle. So we're going to start pretty aggressive. You know, we're going to add, you know, cardio and, and expenditure and steps and whatever we want to do. And then we're going to watch that work. And then the changes will be a lot smaller later. Um, and actually later is when I'll most likely add in something like a refeed or a potential diet break if, if the client, again, can handle it in that time frame, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yes, I would much rather start aggressively uh, and then add later. And I used to do the complete opposite. And I'm so glad that I was like, man, I, it, it, it's not that it didn't work. It just was always kind of like a scramble. <laughs> you know, you're like, no, I totally going to get right. And because at some point, you know, we're, we're talking about, oh, we want to have these long preps, but at some point you got to fucking get on stage, you know, like you can't, you can't make it forever. So starting a little bit more aggressively, I find really, really helps. And then if, again, if somebody was really tapped out at like at the top of their maintenance or surplus, they likely have lost some insulin sensitivity during that period. So just dropping carbs in general is going to help. So some people do that just to start off the prep. Uh, other people do that a little bit before just kind of depends. But yeah, I would say start aggressive and then add more later on is more of the approach that I would use. Because also makes sense that the um, satiety, satiety in regards to satiety and, and hunger, because uh, if you've been in the off season eating in a surplus, well, you're not going to be the hungriest person in the world. Maybe you can tolerate an aggressive diet. Yes. And if your body fat is higher, which it, it will be, you will have higher leptin levels. So there, there's just a lot of reasons as to why we would want to be more aggressive on the front end and then add food later. And again, it does psychologically play into like the excitement of, you know, starting a diet or starting a prep. And then a lot of people are going to want to stick to it then versus later on, if you're like, hey, like we added a refeed, like, oh, so sure. when somebody's like been in off season for six months, they're like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> like, they don't really <laughs> So late, you know, three months into a diet, like they're pretty excited for that. Do you think something like a um, mini cut would be a good starting point or a little less aggressive or maybe in the, in the ranges of a mini cut? So I do like to do mini cuts in the off season um, just as a general thing to, like I said, mention, like I mentioned before, kind of reset that insulin sensitivity. Um, mm -hmm. so sometimes clients are just like oh, tired of eating, um, you know, I'm Bit of a break i would like to lose a little bit of weight um and it's also nice like what's underneath 
what we've been working towards. Um, so these don't have to be super long, um, but it is nice to see that. Of course, there's also, if you are working with a client who is in a weight division, you know, that's going to be a consideration, which would, you know, mostly be like male clients. But, um, you know, if you are working with something like I'm working with a male client right now, who's in that situation, a classic physique. So we have to make sure that weight doesn't get too high because he does need to make weight to compete. So it, it's going to be different for everybody, but I would say, yes, I do like to have a mini cut at some point. Um, when is really going to depend on the client, but I will do that um, at some point in the off season, as long as the off season is long enough, right? If we're having that short off season, it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. The client does have to be fully recovered before we do engage in that. Right. So after our, that brief aggressive period, do you like to keep it a little bit shy of 0.5%? Do you think it's a good ballpark for most people? Yeah. So I'm like the worst evidence-based person. Like I don't really go by a ton of percentages like that. I go by more. Right. What is the client looking like? How are they feeling? Mm -hmm. what are they um, it might be a small percentage. It might be more. So I don't really, I like to go by more of the client biofeedback versus just the numbers. Um, and especially working with female clients, those numbers fluctuate all the time. So it's definitely a little bit more frustrating and, and less Uh, linear than working with male clients. So I typically steer away from that, even though some people really like that. Where's this number going to be? Where's the stage weight? And it's so hard because it's like, listen, it's probably, it's probably leaner than you think we're being honest. So let's take where we think we should be and probably drop it a little bit. And if we happen to be ready outside of that, great. Um, but yeah, I, I tried not to focus too much on that. Instead, go by the other measurements, photos, and, that. and especially for a mini cut, how someone's feeling is also really important. And that's what, that's something I wanted to ask you, especially on females. How do you track body weight? Because there's huge fluctuations. I see, I see crazy stuff like two or three kilograms in one day, and then they lose it. And yep. man, that 0.5, it, it just goes out of the window. I can use that. <laughs> How yep. do you like to, to track progress in terms of body weight? Also, maybe, well, not maybe. How do you take your, your progress photos, maybe videos? How do you like to, yep. to best manage it with female clients? I would say I just use a combination. So it's going to be weight, it's going to be measurements, typically waist and glute, um, and then photos as well is going to be incredibly important in a dieting phase. Um, again, at not as much earlier, really, really important later, right? Because um, we're going to see those more profound changes happen really quickly. And I mean, even like down to the last few weeks, we might have changes every two days with what someone's looking like versus in the beginning of a prep we might not see many changes for two weeks, right? Like it's just going right. to be totally different when somebody's very lean. Um, you can see it very obviously when somebody's at a low percentage. Um, so I like to use a combination of that. And then also, again, knowing the client, um, asking them the right questions, you know, if they are a seasoned competitor, like if you've done this, for a while, like, you know, like when you're on the brink of a drop versus like, nah, I I'm kind of tapped out at this. Like I, I need to make, I need to make, And, and and that's when you know the client is in a really good spot too and you can have that communication with them to be like all right how are you feeling like is things are things moving or we need to make a drop and a lot of people will be like no you're right like i would love to eat more but it's time and even like when i used to compete i had this intuitive sense almost of when i was like all right things are feeling too good <laughs> right, right. <laughs> adjustment you know like there is of course it doesn't need to be like totally awful every day but there is a period where you get if you're a little com if you're too comfortable during prep you're you're gonna stall out and you're you're just cutting yourself short and you're really just extending your your yeah i like to use a combination of factors um and especially yeah. the client photos are going to be super important um the leaner that they get Right, and something I wanted to ask you, we had a, uh, a chat with Bill Cumble recently, and I asked him too about the, the, the study you carried out with him about flexible and rigid approaches. Do you apply some of the things maybe you found you learned from that study in your clients, or you, do you have a go-to method, let's say? Oh, no, that's, that completely changed how I coached people um right. like a hundred percent so when i first started i started coaching in 2013 and it was very much like if you follow a meal plan or anything that resembles a meal plan you're an idiot you're a bro and i am is the future um right. science if you don't do hit cardio like you're a loser like that's like that's where we were in 2013 right and then when i carried out this research and i was like oh wow like there's 
Ooh, there's more to life and there's more than just tracking macros and, and tracking macros is amazing. Um, but really what my study highlighted more so was the intent and the eating behaviors that somebody was going to exhibit around food. It didn't matter if it was a meal plan or if it was macros or anything in between. The intent of how someone is applying rigid or flexible dietary restraint is what is most important. So we use that now with every one of our clients. Like that is woven into all of our coaching philosophies at Team Local Fit. Whether they are a lifestyle client, performance athlete, or a physique athlete, we are trying to teach clients flexible restraint versus rigid restraint. And that doesn't matter if they're tracking habits or macros, a self-created meal plan, you know, an elimination plan, it doesn't matter. It's the flexible restraint around that. So I would say that, yes, that's been incredibly important to my coaching career. And definitely use that with uh, physique clients as well. With most, most people would say, no, no, no. Why would you use anything that's flexible? The physique client has to be such a rigid approach. And it is certainly much more rigid than a lifestyle client. Um, but we're still applying it with that flexible lens. So I always try to explain to people like it's, it's flexible doesn't mean that we're off plan. Right. That's, that's a really key distinguishing thing here. Um, let's say you're trapped and you brought all your food and it's spoiled. Now, what are you going to do? not eat or are you going to go off the rails because it wasn't your food no you need to have flexible restraint to say okay i know pretty much what was on my plan i brought grilled chicken i had some veggies i had carbs with one of my meals you can go out and eat that you have to now make that's you exerting flexible restraint over your choices rigid was restraint would say like i can't eat anything or i'm just going to eat all of this stuff so that's where it's it's about applying that restraint model um and really operating through the lens of flexible restraint so yes i use that with every type of client that we have and that has completely shaped and changed uh team local fit as a whole because i think rigid rigidity also plays a key role in being less stressful maybe at the beginning stages that you do it this and that and that's it you don't have to think about anything else but as you go with that maybe you begin to instead of having these veggies you have these other veggies uh, mostly in the in the sense of preventing deficiencies I think both have a role. Do you, do you think that's a little better way to approach it? Oh, yes, for sure. I think that every, and that's why I got away from just saying like, hey, macros is the best or meal plan is the best or this is awful. Everything works. Everything works. It depends on where the client is at, depends on their life. And when we look at the habit change literature, when somebody is new in an area, right, whether like, let's say the area is food, they've never tracked yeah. their food or they don't really have a handle on the food. Taking away a behavior is a lot easier than adding a positive behavior. Only when somebody has become more skilled is it easier to add a behavior in. So to your point, yes, when someone is first starting, taking away a negative behavior or taking away something that maybe isn't helping them is what is most useful. But then once they've developed some competency and some skill, then we can start to add these other positive behaviors and branch out a little bit more. So that's where we can apply that lens of, hey, yeah, like let's take away maybe some of these foods and and that might be it. Like that might be where somebody starts, like stop drinking mm -hmm. soda and, you know, take away going to this fast food, you know, every week. Okay, like that could be exactly the change that they need. Is that gonna get them to a stage physique? Obviously not, but that's going to improve their health a lot and to say, oh, now, now that I took this away, what should I eat instead? Okay, now great, let's insert more water instead of soda, let's insert this meal or instead of saying hey we can't have any takeout food no that's that's sure. let's say we're gonna have this instead right like go to chipotle instead of going to mcdonald's that's just an example right so those are how we would maybe start people is that how we're gonna have a contest with client of course not but the to bring it back to where we first started having someone in the right place beforehand if if that client was like if that same client was like yeah i want to do a prep Oh gosh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that would work. <laughs> Say, we need to build up those habits regardless of the goal. But also, maybe in the final stages of a contest prep, especially in women, when they have, let's say, um, really few calories, maybe they can just eat protein, some veggies, and that's it. End of story. Maybe then macros, ah, they can be can be tricky, right? Oh, yeah. I, I always try to tell people, like, at the end of a prep, you're pretty much just eating off of your, like, self-created meal plan. And to be honest, <laughs> anyway, um, right. I don't know who has time to be, like, prepping all this different food every day and all that. No. I, even now, I don't I don't track, right? I don't, I don't go in and say, hey, I have these three exact numbers. Um, but I prep food 
and I have my meals downstairs uh, and I know, okay, this is what I'm going to prep for a few days. This is what I'm going to eat. It, it, it would be so chaotic to sit down every day and try and plan a, a new thing to eat. Now, I'm not saying you have to eat the same thing every single day or every single week. We can change that on a weekly basis. But when you go to the grocery store, like, hey, this is what I want to eat for the week. I'm going to make this and then I'm going to eat that for the week. So you only really need to, you can plan for a few days at a time. And that's how I would, I would do things in my prep. And that's how I still do things now. You know, of course, now I have that added flexibility. I will go out to eat more. I do travel a lot more and I don't have to bring every single thing with me. So there is going to be more fluctuation. Mm. There. Um, but on a regular basis, like when I'm home, yeah, I go to the grocery store. I pick foods that I'm going to eat. I prep them. I eat the same shit for a few days. It's super easy. Click. And that, you know, that's going to be what happens during prep as well. Now, of course, somebody has, you know, when you have a family and you have kids and things are a little bit different, but even the earlier meals, hey, let's have breakfast and lunch that we know exactly what we're going to eat. And then dinner can be a little bit more flexible, but we have an idea of what we're going to have, right? And mm -hmm. that helps so much because there's only so much mental capacity that we can output every day. And especially when we're talking about the end of a prep, there's very little mental capacity that is <laughs> that is it is stretched very thin so if we add in something like let me adjust this meal perfectly etc etc no like let's just keep it pretty simple and uh, i find that that helps a lot also in the um, thinking about food if you have your macros and you're in the late stages of a prep oh maybe i can fit these cookies and then you begin starting thinking about more and more and more about food it can become <laughs> Yeah, you go down this path of trying to think, how can I incorporate this? And just, just no, nope, probably not going to work for goals right now. It's not even worth entertaining, right? So I would say, yeah, like to your point, keep it really simple, pre-plan. It's much easier that way, and you're going to stick with it a lot better. Regard again, regardless of the goal, but especially when we're talking about a low calorie, low body fat situation like a contest prep. Sure. And also to touch a little bit on refits and diet breaks. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky subject because there's no, no, uh, not a single way to do them. Maybe not everybody needs them. Uh, we don't have a guideline for them. Uh, the, the research is like, oh, diet breaks, they didn't change anything but hunger. <laughs> and, and also the time factor. How do you like to incorporate or maybe not? How can you best decide with your clients? Where, yeah. What are the things you take into account, Lori? So I would typically first start with refeeds over a diet break, just for obvious reasons. It's a shorter amount of time and we can control things. You know, certain people are going to respond. You know, some people are going to have a refeed day or two and drop weight, right? Other people are going to be the person that every time you add food, they are just gaining. So why I wouldn't do, I wouldn't have a week of higher calories for that person is just set them back. So typically I would like to start with a refeed or two, see where someone is. Um, and then potentially if that's going really well, if it seems like they need a diet break, we could push for, you know, more days. And yeah, to your point, there's, there's only so much research out there, right? And, and no matter how much research, we could have 100 papers on this, ultimately, it comes down to coaching the individual. So I would say starting more conservatively is always going to be the best bet. Um, and for some people, what I found was because I was, you know, again, super staunch, like refeeds are the best thing. And then I started to find that some clients would feel way worse, like after refeeds, they would be incredibly hungry they'd be much more food focused because they were like oh i had all this food and now i have to go back this is awful and i found that it was it was affecting their adherence so any of the positives that we're going to see are going to be you know small they could be positive but they're going to be small positives so i'm not going to trade off that potential potential positive for this huge negative of you falling off plan and probably overeating and you overeating that deep into a prep is not going to be a little that's not going to be all 100 calories or two that's that's going to be a lot so the potential, hey, we're going to maintain a little bit more muscle mass, uh, store a little more glycogen, that's all great. And that works for certain clients. And I do love refeeds for that reason. But if I find the client is struggling with adherence because of it, we are not doing that. Um, but I would say that having a refeed is certainly going to yeah, replenish some glycogen stores, give a boost of energy, kind of calm that very hungry person that lives inside of us when we're prepping. <laughs> For some people, right, um, have a have a good night of sleep. You know, sometimes it's just like it's really nice to be like, wow, I had I had a day or two that I felt better and more human. Uh, so, for some people, that's perfect, and then they can get right back into the deficit. Um, if somebody's feeling really, really trashed and really run down, I'll try to give them a few days, see how they tolerate that, maybe three or four, and then that's when we could potentially continue it out for a whole week for you know a whole diet break. Um, but again, practically speaking, how close are we to the show? 
You know, is this going to set us back or is this going to help us? And that's why I, I said I would rather start slow and say we're going to have a few days like this and then potentially um, bring it up to a week. But that's only depending on how the clients are tolerating it. And also in regards to refits, do you think or do you like to incorporate them maybe in, in a rest day from training or when they have their, their hardest training? Because that's yeah. also yeah. a variable. It is one of those things that, you know, people will debate, right? Have it on a rest day. So then the next mm -hmm. day is good. Have it on your training day. Like, so I, I go, I defer to the client. I say, hey, this would be the, the reasons why, you know, for this first one, let's pick it on a, just a day that you want to choose. And then we'll see how you respond and adjust from there. Um, I always found personally that if you had, um, you know, at the day after a refeed, I always felt pretty good and I would have a pretty good training session there. Um, but you could maybe eke out two good training days if you did time, you know, more carbs, obviously pre-training for that, for the refeed day. And then also the subsequent day. So I find that you can get two good days out of that, but some people do like having it on the rest day. Um, of course, that would be probably somebody who has a what we, we, faster metabolism. Some For the client that like everything sticks to them, I probably wouldn't have more carbs on a day where they're just totally resting. Again, mm -hmm. depend on the individual. Um, but I would say best case scenario, try to have it on, a, on you can't have it if you have two back to back training days, have more carbs pre training on the refeed day and then also expect to have a good training day the next day, maybe like an earlier training session. So maybe like have the refeed Friday, train Friday mm. later and then Saturday, right? Like you can maybe get two, <laughs> get two good sessions. Um, but it is tough. And, you know, that's of course where like a double refeed is, is really nice. Um, but again, depending on where the client's at, how they respond to carbs and all that, they might not be able to tolerate that. And also with the time factor, diet breaks do you like to incorporate them when do you think a person might need might not need them how do you like to incorporate or, or, or not yeah it really is going to go by what they're telling me right if somebody's like hey you know i'm super run down um i you know everything is just awful like i feel like i'm gonna fall off plan i'm really dragging ass and we're not just a few weeks out because a few weeks out i'm like listen that's kind of where we're at for most people not everybody but totally But if we're, you know, kind of mid prep or, you know, or really any, any time before those last few weeks, somebody's feeling like that. That's when I'll say, Hey, let's do three refeed days. See how they respond. If they're doing, well, okay, let's do a whole week of this. If somebody has gained six pounds and they're like, Oh my God, this is awful. I feel terrible. Okay. We're not going to, that was enough. Right. Like, so I don't like to fully commit to it unless I've worked with that person before. And I know they respond really well to several days of it um, or even a week of it. But I would say it's going to go by feel. I never like to predetermine when I'm going to do them. Again, I think that the rationale behind that it is great in theory. Like, hey, for every this many weeks of dieting, we're going to have a diet break. I understand and, and respect that. But it might not work out exactly like that, right? You might have, it might work out exactly that way. Or it might work out to where it you have more kind of at the end of the prep or you don't have any at all. Um, and in the best case scenario, I would love to get somebody lean enough before their show so that we can actually add food into the show. And that's going to be a more advantageous thing in my estimation um, versus adding more of those refeeds or the diet break weeks earlier. So that's when I would incorporate maybe some more refeeds. And then, hey, hopefully we're lean enough. And those last few weeks, we can taper cardio down and bring food up and do a really tight reverse into the show those last few weeks. That is what I would much prefer to do. And, and just from a time perspective, that is, we usually can't do both. Right. And I think one of the next subjects I wanted to, to ask you about I think it's not often discussed and it's really important in the female competitor um, about menstrual cycle dysfunction. When a woman loses her period um, or, or maybe not completely, but they, they have starting to have issues in regards to this. Is it normal? Is it something you have to expect when you're talking about a competitive, uh, let, let's say bikini, let's say maybe any category. Let's yeah. talk about extreme leanness. Is it something a woman has to be prepared? I would say being prepared for it is the best option, right? You don't want to be surprised by anything. Um, does everybody lose their cycle? No. Um, but do, do a large majority? Yes. Um, the body fat 
levels that are required for a female competitor are just typically so far outside of their normal settling point. Now, again, right. somebody who is naturally very lean, they might not see issues till the very end, or they might just have an extended cycle or something like that. Um, but for most people who are at an average body fat percentage in the off season, getting down to that 10, 12% is going to be a really far diff big difference for them. So it is going to be normal, I, I, regardless of what you take, how you diet. Um, I would say that it is, it is likely going to happen. Now there are ways to ease into that, right? Like, we could make it really bad if we just said from the very beginning from the prep we're going to completely slash all of your carbs all of your fats do two hours of cardio a day like that would be a way to lose your cycle really really early in a prep um so i'm not saying that we want to lose it or we want to lose it as late as possible but just understanding that it is potentially going to happen and then it might and most likely will i think is an important conversation because that is an important thing to touch on with clients, you know, right? They could be like, oh my God, I had no idea. I wanted to do this show. I didn't realize this, this would affect me. Mm -hmm. But 100% affect you. And I have plenty of lifestyle clients who also deal with this. They're not even near that level of leanness. You would look, you would look at them. I have competitors who still have a cycle and lifestyle clients who don't. And you're like, whoa. And that is just because, again, somebody, some people have much more sensitive systems to how, yeah. how away from that settling point. So I think that it's just an important discussion to have. And, and if somebody is naturally leaner and they have a cycle, they are likely going to be able to keep it as they get leaner. For somebody whose settling point is higher and they're trying to get very lean, chances are it's gonna be a really big struggle to keep that. Um, and of course, there's always a discussion, you know, can you, you know, for, you know, enhancement and, and all that, that's a totally different discussion. If somebody wants to do that, it's totally fine, um, you know, female HRT, et cetera, if that works within your federation. And that could, of course, help keep the cycle. But ultimately, if you're that, that lean and your calories are that low and your just energy expenditure is so high, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty hard. So it's important to recognize that that is a potential side effect and everybody's affected differently afterwards, right? Some people get it right back. Um, other people, not so much. So again, no. And then every time you do this, that can compound, you know, some people compete, they get pregnant, no problem. Other people who are like, yeah, I competed for a few years. And you know, I lost my cycle, it's no big deal. And then they try to get pregnant. They're like, Oh, wow, this is a really big issue. So um, I think that the discussion is certainly happening more, way more. I mean, when I first started, nobody even, even uttered these words, you know, um, and it just because it just wasn't as popular of a topic. And, and, you know, it's, it's coming much more mainstream right especially on social media and the conversations and podcasts and different things like this where people are talking about it and it's much more understood so um, i would say that genetic variability really really plays the biggest factor here but then of course the overall level of leanness and the energy deficit that somebody is in is going to highly influence it as well because that that in itself is a huge topic we can talk about metabolic adaptation the constrictor the energy model i think so uh, relative energy deficiency in sport because it's not the loss of a menstrual cycle. What happens with, with bones? What happens in a psychological level? What happens in um, um, with your reproductive health? A whole lot of stuff that gets gets influenced by the loss of cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and it's it's just an, it's an important consideration. If you know, like we said in the beginning, if you not everybody is a candidate to compete, and you have to just be aware of all the things that could potentially happen doesn't mean they're all going to happen to you right um doesn't mean that just because you step on stage you know you're going to lose your period for five years and you know all your hair is going to fall out and you're going to have a terrible relationship with food and you're going to have an eating disorder no none of that could happen but we have to be prepared and just you know acknowledge the thing these things are there and especially that the more that somebody competes it's going to compound and i always like to say that these adaptations will compound over time the more that you do them and that's just the reality. And and most clients are coming into this with some type of dieting history outside of that already. You know, right. um, most women are coming and saying, hey, you know, I've been dieting for X, Y, Z years. You know, I've been dieting since I was 15. I've been watching my food intake. I've been doing this. So we can't expect, you know, somebody's, if they're coming to us and they're 35 and they want to do their first show and they've been yo-yo dieting for 20 years, like, well, that's also going to have its own whole host of adaptations that we're bringing into this that we have to take into consideration. Um, and your, your body is very different than the 20 year old who's starting to compete, who's never had any eating issues. And that's why they're, you know, super lean and eating 400 carbs and making all these training gains, right? Like it's just a completely different 
client and we just have to be aware of that. And I'm glad we're having more and more of these conversations yeah. and, and hearing it from you. I think, I hope it helps a lot of people. And now that we touch on all those subjects, one that you mentioned in the beginning, okay, then the, you completed. You, let's assume you did very well. It was all fun and games. But what happens after? How can you manage weight gain? Uh, if you lost your cycle, what do you have to do to get it back? Mm -hmm. What do you like to, what conversation do you like to have with your clients about what happens next? Because some people, they compete it and then they disappear. <laughs> Yeah, so afterwards is absolutely the hardest part. There is no period of time that is harder than the first 12 weeks after a contest prep. It is absolutely <laughs> catastrophically different. Um, this huge goal that you've worked towards, right, is suddenly gone. <laughs> very, very high, high. You're now riding this low, low. Um, your body is changing. It doesn't matter how perfect your reverse or your recovery is shit just sticks weird after an extreme diet right like i always like i literally feel like like body fat is just like getting thrown on you like you're almost like wh where is this like sitting like it just doesn't look right the first few weeks anybody who's dieted knows what i'm talking about um and you don't have to be a uh, you can be a lifestyle client so experienced i have plenty of clients who are like i just feel like it's i'm like give it a few weeks give it a few weeks it'll settle um but yeah so you're, you're coming off this really really lean body and fat is just kind of accumulating weirdly and like in weird spots you're uncontrollably hungry um you're potentially on this just like very low dopamine level and now also you have all these people who are like let's go out to eat let's go do all this stuff like you're done prepping like let's go have fun and then you're trying to battle also this like psychological like i want to stay lean forever but like i just don't want to be doing this anymore and it's this huge interplay so it's it's important to just share, hey, this is a really hard time. We need to be prepared mentally that this is going to be a hard time. And the number one thing I try to have clients avoid after a show is overeating. Does it happen? Yes, of course. I, I would say that for most people, there's going to be a day, a two, a meal, at least, that they're like, wow, I really shouldn't have done that, but it happened, and let's move on. But what we really want to avoid is these uncontrolled overeating episodes that happen over and over and over again. Because like I said before, when somebody's going like in an off season, hey, I had a little bit more, a little bit more to eat today. Okay, 100, 200, cal 300 calories, no big deal. After a show, I had a little overeating episode. That could be 2,000 calories, easy. We do that a few times to a body, mm -hmm. all these adaptations, that's not going to end well. You know, that is where we're going to see. And then what ends up happening is we have these compensatory behaviors. Oh, I overate today. So now I'm going to keep doing a bunch of cardio and then I'm going to slash my food. And that is one of the easiest ways to not get a cycle back also. Because now, even though you've, got, you've added body fat, your body is like, this is not consistent. I am not happy at all. <laughs> so we really want to say, okay, what can we do to minimize that? One, I like to bump up calories aggressively right at the end of a prep. Just like I like to start aggressively with a cut, I like to end aggressively on the other way. I like to add food. I still do keep in cardio. I, don't, I mean, I'm going to drop cardio, of course, but I do want to keep that activity in. I want to keep things moving. Um, you know, maybe give a few free weeks the gym like hey just do whatever you want you know like obviously you're a little usually a little burned out from your normal stuff um and then really try to focus on okay let's where are we going to incorporate some flexibility let's plan some of these events because everybody wants to go out and do stuff with you like why don't we plan this ahead of time instead of being like oops i you know i just came up and then all of a sudden we have you know this string of overeating episodes uh and then the client's like oh my gosh i'm so unhappy i've gained a bunch of weight it's like well this is why right so we have to just manage the manage the expectations set up the plan so that somebody is actually going to be successful um and then you know also again to preface it with like this is going to be hard let's try to focus on some things outside of your physique we don't need to take 100 pictures a day we don't need to get on the scale twice a day you know we don't need to you know let's start where are we going to shift our focus are these going to be training goals are these going to be personal development goals are these going to be career goals do we want to do some travel that we didn't do before right like let's shift our focus somewhere else not to say fuck bodybuilding, I'm not going to go to the gym and I'm going to eat whatever I want, but so that we're no, not so hyper obsessed with like, did my waist go down? Or like, what do I look like in this book? We want to avoid that um, and, you know, try to circumvent some of those issues. There, I think there are two popular strategies after a contest. 
One is the recovery diet, which makes it a little more in, in line with what you said about being aggressive after the diet. Okay. And then there's reverse dieting. That it, you're staying on a deficit, but maybe you add 1,500 calories uh, little by little till you, let's say, build up. But I think that I'm not sure. I'm not really sold about that because in the context after a, a, a contest, maybe that can turn into binging. Oh, 100%. That, that's why I stopped stopped using it, right? I realized... Oh, you used to use it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Because again, that was yeah. like, oh, that's, what, that's what we're going to do. Like, right? Like, we got to remember it. And <laughs> yeah. uh, add 10 carbs. And oh, cool. We can add <laughs> carbs and still stay lean. And it's like, that does not work, right? That works for maybe the client who is already predisposed to be lean, the client who is super neurotic with their food. Um, but do I really want to continue those ultra neurotic behaviors into the off season? Probably not. Um, and for 95% of the other clients, it was failing. And it was failing terrible for me. I tried it many times. And I was like, oh my God, this is awful. So through my own experience and through coaching, you know, many, many clients through this, I realized, wow, like this is not the approach. And, you know, so we need to add calories more aggressively if we want to call it the recovery diet. You know, they, you know, 3DMJ has coined that and I respect that fully. Um, so yes, if we want to call it that, like we're going to add calories, we're going to drop the cardio. We're still going to keep activity up you know but we're gonna we're gonna reduce it um and for me what i really like to do is i want to add that flexibility right away i want to add that untracked meal i want to have something outside of our normal plan baked into the plan so that the clients actually feel successful with it and they're not just like oh my gosh like pff, what i can't go I, I stopped this prep and now i still can't go and do anything that's going to set up one either now they're staying in their house and they're like oh no i can't leave because of then we're having all these other issues which could also create a binge or they're just like, you know what, screw this, I'm going to go out and then I'm going to go out for three days in a row. And then I'm, like, it just, it just builds and builds in, in a negative way. So we really want to avoid that as well. <laughs> and I think it comes down to the first thing we were talking about, uh, about a person being ready for a contest prep that uh, I wanted to put the, the example of maybe a female competitor that, competitor that lost her cycle. What do you have to do to get it back? Mm, well, we know we have to gain some body fat, but if you come from being super lean like you've never been before and then you tell a client you need to gain that fat back, uh, maybe it's going to be a little a little tricky situation, right? Yes. No, it's definitely going to be tricky, and, and this is going to be so individualized, so I don't even want to really give like basic recommendations, but I would say... Certainly, one we need to get we need to reduce the energy deficit, right? So we need to bring up calories. We need to lower cardio. That's number one. Um, number two, we you know need to add a healthy level of body fat. But three, the caveat is we can't be adding it so fast and then also like overeating and undereating because that is going to be a very very stressful situation for the body. So it's not just about the calories and the body fat. I have found that that third piece really is where the client is mentally, how stressed they are around food and, and their physique and, and what they're doing. Because if they are, like I said, overeating and then undereating, they could have gained 30 pounds and still not have a cycle. Right. Not just about that. It, it, it is about that in conjunction with we're doing this in the right time. And then of course, again, there can be supplementation, whether that's natural or prescribed, you know, to help with, you know, like, like Chase Berry is great to help get progesterone back up. Um, that doesn't work for everybody, but it can work for some people that is over the counter. Um, but again, that's going to just depend on the client. And, you know, some people are going to need some other hormonal therapies. I wouldn't recommend that right away. If they haven't already been doing that, I would say, hey, let's give it a few months naturally to come up. But that might be something that, hey, I still don't have a cycle. Everything else is kind of good to go and checked out. Might be time to incorporate that again, if that works for um, you know, where you're competing. So it's certainly a very nuanced topic that's going to be so different for everybody. But yes, increasing calories, lowering expenditure, increasing body fat, but doing so in a consistent way that is not stressing your body out meant like physically or mentally, because you're not going to regain a cycle if you're in that type of a place. Right. Like you said that your body's like, ah, yeah, it's cool, but it's not going every day. Right. You need that consistency. Yeah, it like it's like wait, we're having a thousand calories three days a week, and then like two thousand the other days, <laughs> and then like a four thousand day in there every once in a while. Like, <laughs> really chaotic cardio and training. You're, like, totally, your just mindset is just trash. Like, no, it's not a consistent or happy place for your body. <laughs> 
So, Lauren, I want to be super respectful of your time. It's been a super insightful, super fun, at least. <laughs> at least yeah. I've been mean, I mean, learning tons from you. But do you think you can give a little bit of brief recommendations for the females out there that maybe are deciding if they want to compete, if they want to expose themselves to that, to that stress? How can they begin to tell if there are candidates for it? Or what can you, can you tell them from your experience and also from all the, your personal experience competing and also from all the thousands and thousands of clients that you work with? Yeah, so I would say, I would say, listen to this call, <laughs> uh, listen to this live, but because we went over some really good stuff and you asked some really amazing questions. But I would say, first and foremost, put yourself in that position to say, okay, am I willing to, I, I want to compete. Can I take a whole year before I get on stage? Really ask yourself that. Can I dedicate to an off season to eating more than I probably would like to, to train really hard, to focusing on my recovery, um, to pretend being a little fluffy, you know, chicks love that word. I'm a little fluffy right now. Right? Are you willing to do that? Because you're willing to push on the diet end, but are you willing to push in the off season end? That is the key. So if you're not willing to do that, that's already going to be out Two, Are you ready for the rigors of contest prep? You're tired. You're hungry. You're fatigued. Doesn't matter. Right? Like, like, are you ready to put yourself in that position to where you feel like that day in and day out? And if you're not, then that's also okay, but you're not ready to compete. Um, and also really examine why, you know, is this a physique goal or is this a, I want to have a competitive outlet goal? Cause those are two very different things. And if it's just a physique goal, I would say, Hey, we can get really, really lean and do something cool, like a crazy photo shoot or whatever. And we don't need to dip below that like contest level leanness. Um, but if it really is like, Hey, I want to have a competitive outlet, then let's go for it. But we need to make sure that we're taking enough time beforehand and during. And then lastly, are we going to be able to, you know, maintain a coaching relationship afterwards and be able to really work through these struggles afterwards? Because that after component is just as important as the prep. Very well. So I just want to thank you for your valuable time, for your valuable lessons. I hope we can do this again another time. It's been a huge pleasure and a huge honor, Lauren. Oh, no, this was great. I would love to come back on. We can set it up. Oh, awesome. Have, I'll be happy to go over. Very well. So I don't want to take any more of your time. I hope you have a great day. And thanks again. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you guys. Hopefully everybody enjoyed this. And yeah, we'll talk soon. See you, see you, Lauren. Bye.